Hello history lovers and welcome back. In light of the release of the Apple TV Napoleon film, we are going to continue our Napoleon November, but today we are going to look at his two wives, Empress Josephine, played by Vanessa Kirby, and Empress Marie Louise, played by Anna Morn. The two women never actually met, but what did they really feel about each other? Before we start, if you're new here, I would really appreciate it if you like and subscribe, and let's explore the relationship of the two wives of Napoleon Bonaparte. For those of you that don't know, Napoleon Bonaparte was the first emperor of France, or emperor of the French. He was born in Corsica and quickly rose through the military before becoming emperor. Napoleon's first wife and empress was Josephine de Beauharnais. Josephine was born Marie Joseph Rose Tasha de la Pagerie on the island of Martinique on the 23rd of June 1763. Josephine, who was known as Rose, came to France at the age of 16 to marry Viscount Beauharnais, Alexandre, with whom she had two children, Eugène and Hortense. This marriage was very unhappy and Alexandre cheated on her frequently. Josephine and her husband were arrested during the French Revolution and Alexandre was a victim of the guillotine. Josephine was saved from the same fate and rebuilt her life. She then met Napoleon Bonaparte, who was smitten with Josephine, and it was he that called her Josephine instead of Rose, and is the reason why she is remembered as Josephine and not Rose. The two wed after only knowing each other for five months on the 9th of March 1796. Despite having two children with her first husband, Josephine failed to provide Napoleon an heir. Rumours were spreading and people were trying to put doubt in Napoleon's mind, but he loved her. Napoleon was made Emperor of France on the 18th of May 1804 and the two wed for a second time this time in a church ceremony on the 1st of December 1804. This second wedding was needed as the Pope refused to coronate Napoleon unless they were wed in the eyes of God. This was also a play by Josephine to make divorce harder as she had still not provided Napoleon an heir and needed to try and provide security for herself. Napoleon and Josephine's coronation happened the next day on the 2nd of December 1804 at Notre Dame Cathedral, where Napoleon infamously took the crown from the Pope and crowned himself, and then Josephine. Reims was the traditional city for coronations, not Paris, but Napoleon chose Paris because Josephine loved it. Josephine almost wasn't crowned as Napoleon had been considering divorce due to a lack of heir. His family believed that at 41, Josephine was too old to provide an heir. I mean, tell that to Janet Jackson. Despite having his brother Louis marry Josephine's daughter Hortense in 1802 so that their children could be heir to the empire, as they would be both of Beauharnais and Bonaparte blood. In 1809, one of Napoleon's mistresses gave birth to an illegitimate child. This proved to Napoleon that he was not infertile, and as a result, he decides to divorce Josephine after 13 years of marriage. He announced the plans for divorce on the 30th of November 1809. He also declared that he still loved Josephine, but his actions were for the interests of France. Josephine burst into tears, but she signed the divorce papers in the December. Josephine then retired to Chateau Malmaison, one of her favourite residences. Napoleon wed Princess Marie Louise by proxy on the 11th of March 1810, and despite being separated, Josephine and Napoleon continued to contact each other. Marie Louise was the eldest child of the Holy Roman Emperor Francis II. Marie Louise arrived in France where she wed Napoleon two more times in a civil and religious ceremony on the 1st and 2nd of April respectively. Josephine meanwhile was living in Chateau Malmaison near Paris, a bit too close to his new wife. So he gave her the Chateau de Navarre 50 miles away and suggested that 
Josephine would stay there while the marriage celebrations were going on in Paris, the city that she loved so much. Despite moving Josephine further away, he kept writing to her, and quite rightly, the new empress was very jealous. Her husband and his ex-wife were very close. After the wedding celebrations were over, Josephine moved back to Malmaison, and Napoleon wrote to Josephine and told her that the empress was pregnant, and that in order to prevent distressing his pregnant wife, Josephine would have to go back to Navarre, while Marie-Louise was in confinement. Josephine arrived at Navarre on the 20th of March 1811, and when she heard about the birth of Napoleon's son, she wrote to him saying, Amid the numerous felicitations you receive from every corner of Europe, can the feeble voice of a woman reach your ear? And will you dine to listen to her who so often consoled your sorrows and sweetened your pains? Now that she speaks to you only of that happiness in which all your wishes are fulfilled, I can conceive every emotion you must experience, as you divine all that I feel at this moment. And though separated, we are united by that sympathy which survives all events. I should have desired to learn of the birth of the King of Rome from yourself, and not from the sound of the canon of Evero or the courtier of the prefect. I know, however, that in preference to all, your first attentions are due to the public authorities of the state, to the foreign ministers, to your family, and especially to the fortunate princess, who has realised your dearest hopes. She cannot be more tenderly devoted to you than I, but she has been enabled to contribute more towards your happiness by securing that of France. She has then a right to your first feelings, to all your cares, and I, who was but your companion in times of difficulty, I cannot ask more than a place in your affection far removed from that occupied by the Empress Maria Luisa. Not till you shall have ceased to watch by her bed. Not till you are weary of embracing your son will you take the pen to converse with your best friend. I will wait. In this letter, Josephine is acknowledging that she knows that Napoleon married Marie Louise, or Maria Louisa, for a child and how she has been able to do the thing that Josephine could not. She also acknowledges how she knows that Marie-Louise has brought him happiness, perhaps more than what she did, and yet she tells Napoleon that Marie-Louise could never be as devoted to him as she was. I find her letter to Napoleon is quite heartbreaking. She has great affections for this man, and I feel that she feels ousted but cares for him so. So you could argue that she envies the woman who was able to do the thing that she could not, and the place she had in Napoleon's heart for doing so. Josephine then also wrote to Marie Louise from Navarre. While you were only the second spouse of the emperor, I deemed it becoming to maintain silence towards your majesty. That reserve, I think, may be laid aside. Now that you are become the mother of an heir to the empire, you might have had some difficulty in crediting the sincerity of her whom perhaps you regarded as a rival. You will give faith to the felicitations of a Frenchwoman, for you have bestowed a son upon France. Your amiableness, amiable, amiableness and sweetness of disposition have gained you the heart of the emperor. Your benevolence merits the blessings of the unfortunate. The birth of a son claims the benedictions of all France. It seems that despite her heartbreak, Josephine was willing to be civil and compliant and even attempt a friendly relation with her replacement. However, Marie-Louise, being a hot-headed teenager, was not willing to be so civilised. Despite being over 20 years younger than her predecessor, the new empress was green with jealousy. Like jealousy. Marie-Louise's jealousy spiked every time that Napoleon seemed to mention Josephine, let alone a visit. You could argue that she was paranoid or anxious that he would rekindle their relationship and she would be replaced the same way that she had replaced Josephine. A strike contrast from the woman who 
had referred to her husband as the Corsican Ogre and the Antichrist. Check out my video on Empress Marie Louise for more information. Napoleon had hoped he might be able to introduce his two wives to each other, but as mentioned in the beginning of this video, the two women never met. I wished one day to take, Marie Louise, to Malmaison, said the Emperor, but she burst into tears when I made the proposal. She said she did not object to my visiting Josephine, only she did not wish to know it. But whenever she suspected my intention of going to Malmaison, there was no stratagem which she did not employ for the sake of annoying me. She never left me, and as these visits seemed to vex her exceedingly, I did violence to my own feelings and scarcely ever went to Malmaison. Still, however, when I did happen to go, I was sure to encounter a flood of tears and a multitude of contrivances of every kind. Josephine had expressed her wishes to meet Napoleon's son, the King of Rome. But with Marie Louise's anxiety and dislike of Josephine, arranging this meeting was incredibly difficult. Marie Louise could not know, as she would be filled with jealousy and fear of the influence that Josephine, a woman Napoleon had once loved, might have over her husband and she would have been mortified to know that her rival had met her son. However, the meeting did take place, a testament to their close bond. The secret meeting took place at Chateau de Bagatelle, a small royal palace near Paris. The King of Rome's governess, Madame de Montesquieu, brought the young Napoleon, as he spent more time with his governesses than his mother. At the sight of seeing the young boy, Josephine cried as he was a living reminder of the child she and Napoleon did not produce and the happiness she was now deprived of. Although, don't get me wrong, she had a nice life at Malmaison. Josephine kissed the young child as if he was her own, held him on her lap and admired his strength and his grace and could not detach herself from him. Josephine died on the 29th of May 1814 at the age of 50. When Napoleon was in exile in Elba, he was deeply saddened by her death and he would follow his dearest Josephine in 1821. Marie Louise would outlive them both and her son, the King of Rome, and she would die at the age of 56 on the 17th of December 1847. Despite their rivalry, albeit pretty much one-sided, the two women were loved by Napoleon, and both of them had a lasting impact on France. Their legacy is shown in the architect and the people that they left behind. If you like this video, then make sure to share this video with a friend, and be sure to subscribe and check out my other Napoleon-related videos. But until the next one, have a wonderful day.